you know, in my long journey through ecological activism, 35 years now, uh, money has been the intervener propelling ecological destruction. The first movement I got involved in was Chipko, where women of my region, peasant women, came out to say, we'll hug the trees, you'll have to kill us before you kill the tree. Because these trees are our life, they are our mothers, they give us water, they give us soil, they give us fodder, they give us fuel, and deforestation is leading to disappearance of water, disappearance of energy, and ecological catastrophes like landslides. And why were the trees being cut? Very simply, because cutting a tree makes money. Leaving a tree in place gives you stable ecosystems, gives you basic needs, gives you material welfare, avoids poverty, but cutting a tree leads to huge profits for the logging companies and the countries count it as the growth of the gross domestic product. A live tree doesn't contribute to the GDP, a killed tree does. And that is the base, ba basis of why the more our economies grow, the more people suffer and the more the planet suffers. In the case of agriculture, I got involved in 1984 because of two terrible disasters in India. Um, 1984 is also the name of a very interesting novel written by George Orwell. And 1984 was a very Orwellian year for us. In June of that year, one of the worst violence took place in our history in recent times. Um, there had been extremism in Punjab. People think terrorism began with the Al-Qaeda. No, it, it began in Punjab began in Punjab because the so-called Green Revolution was supposed to bring prosperity and peace and a Nobel Peace Prize was given for the Green Revolution. But what was the Green Revolution? The Green Revolution was nothing but bringing money-making into agriculture. Before the Green Revolution, agriculture was about care for the soil, providing nourishing food, secure livelihoods, a cultural identity in connection with the earth. Post-Green Revolution, agriculture was about corporations making money, selling costly seeds and chemicals. It was about farmers getting into debt because they couldn't afford to spend that kind of money. Initial stages, they took to the gun, shot people, and eventually they were killed in return. 30,000 people were killed in that period of violence in Punjab. That is six times 9-11. And today, that violence continues. It's not through the gun, it's through drinking pesticide to end their lives. 200,000 farmers have committed suicide in India in the last decade alone as a money-driven agriculture. An agriculture which is designed not to protect the earth, not to protect the seed, not to give food to people, but is designed only to make money, has killed people. 1984, the other event that shook me up was Bhopal, a pesticide plant owned then by Union Carbide, now by Dow Chemicals, leaked in the middle of the night of 2nd of December and killed 3,000 people, immediately 30,000 people since then. I started to look at agriculture at that point. I said, why has agriculture become like war? And wasn't surprised to find that it had become like war because it started in war. And chemicals that were designed to make money in war were moved to agriculture as pesticides. Chemicals from Fertilizer factories, which were originally explosive factories, were moved into farming and into producing of food. So no matter which way you look at it, the making of money has become the curse of farming and agriculture. It's destroyed our soils, it's destroyed our biodiversity, it's destroyed our water. There's a recent report out from NASA about how the groundwater of North India is gone, but NASA doesn't connect it to the prescriptions of the United States to put chemicals into farming, and those chemicals require intensive irrigation, and the irrigation comes out of mining groundwater. So it's at every point, this focus of money is a recipe for impoverishment. Small-scale peasants, which still constitute half of humanity, people forget that. Um, Small-scale peasants have lived in an economy with either no money or marginal money. They have lived in an economy where 
They grew the food they need. They could sell part of it at the local marketplace, very often through barter. And if money had even entered, it was not driving the design of agriculture. But once the chemicals entered agriculture through the Green Revolution, and once the new seeds entered agriculture, initially through so-called high-yielding varieties, which were merely high-response varieties, they did well as long as there was lots of water, lots of chemicals, but totally failed. For example, in this year in India, when we have a horrible drought, the Green Revolution fields are empty, the native crops are flourishing. Um, more recently, um, corporations like Monsanto have tried to bring in genetically engineered seed, and they began with genetically engineered cotton. Now, the acceleration of farmer suicides in India is in the areas where farmers have been made dependent on the genetically engineered cotton. How does it work? The company comes in, encourages farmers to give up their own seeds. It's called seed replacement. It's like you trade in your old car to buy a new car. You go to uh, a place where you put in your second-hand stuff and get something else in return. That's the logic that is created. Seed, which should never stop being saved, is now treated as an exchangeable commodity. Videos are shown with gods and goddesses and the epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata and Guru Nanak. All our 300 million divinities are mobilized to be salesmen for Monsanto to say, you're going to be a millionaire. Here's a miracle seed. This is going to deliver you out of poverty. And since the farmers have never known the epics to cheat them, they haven't known Lord Ram to cheat them, they believe in this. They don't see a corporation called Monsanto. In fact, Monsanto's name is never on the label because Monsanto sells its seeds through licensing arrangements with local companies. So Monsanto is an invisible giant bringing this promise of becoming farmers becoming a millionaire, forcing them to give up their seeds, and before you know it, in one season, farmers have lost their local seeds. They now only have genetically engineered seed, which they must buy every year. The price of seed was zero if it was farm-safe seed. It was seven rupees a kilo if it was bought before the GM seed. The GM seed price shot it all up to 1,700 rupees a kilo, from seven to 1,700. These seeds are supposed to control pests, but they fail to control the pest called the bollworm. New pests get created. Our studies show 13-fold increase in pesticide use in the genetically engineered cotton areas. That means high cost for pesticides, high cost of seeds, high cost of seed every year. The seeds are hybrid genetically engineered seed. They need irrigation. Farmers spend more money trying to drill tube wells in areas that doesn't have reliable water supply. Add it up in two years' time, the farmers have 200,000, 300,000 rupees debt. And meantime, the global trading system, which is also designed by the global corporations, dumps subsidized cotton on countries like India or Africa. Four billion dollars of subsidies is given in the United States to a handful of giant farms. And that brings the price of cotton down. So you've got a cost of production shooting up and you've got the price of your produce dropping down that's a negative economy, which totally crushes the farmer. And since this is happening in areas where farmers never knew deep poverty, they were actually prosperous farmers. Cotton growing farmers were some of the most prosperous farmers of India. They're the ones who could send their children to engineering school and medical school. They are in such a state of shock. The day their land is being appropriated, that's the day they drink pesticide and end their lives. It's usually the man, because it's the man who was seduced into believing this is going to be the next step to prosperity. And the wife is informed only after the dead body of the husband is found. So we have 200,000 farm suicides, 200,000 farm widows. And I've done public hearings with these widows. But all of this is triggered by Monsanto wanting to make super profits out of the seed business, a company that 20 years ago did not exist in seed today is the biggest company in seed. And money is make, bringing its power, but money is bringing the death to the small peasants of India. I think we, we got to this place because real wealth and real work was substituted by money. Money has been around. You, know, you can find coins from Roman times. In India, you can find coins from pre-Christ eras. But 
money was always just a means, and you knew very well it's a means to another end. The end has to be valued in and of itself. But over time, what happened was money took over not as a means, but as a measure of wealth. And slowly it start to dis started to displace the real wealth creating capacity of people. And it also started to displace the real wealth creating capacity of nature, because those are the two places where actual things are produced. Nature gives us wood by growing the trees. It gives us soil fertility by renewing the fertility through microorganisms. It cleans up the air with the carbon cycle. That has been an amazing production system. But a, a distancing took place from the real world in which real lives are led. And money started to become an overwhelming state of measurement. At the time of the wars, governments had to mobilize more money and therefore they had to make people believe that the real money, that the real objective of money was to be able to finance the war. So looking after children, making sure people had food, all of that became secondary. And the very measurement of the gross developed domestic product and the gross national product is if I produce what I consume, I am not producing. Which means that if I am self-reliant, if I'm actually productive, I get knocked out. A woman who runs an entire household, feeds her children, is not a producer. It doesn't count. A peasant building self-reliant food economies, food sovereign economies, doesn't count. It's only when the Monsantos enter the scene and the Cargills enter the scene, suddenly food gets measured in terms of money because now it's being bought. Those who grow it have to sell it. Those who eat it must buy it. And the cycle of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, sovereignty starts to get broken. And this has been taken one step further by new instruments being created like the derivatives, like the securitization, and we saw what that reckless uh, construction of money out of money through fictitious instruments has given us. It gave us the September 2008 Wall Street collapse, out of which countries haven't come out, and it, it wasn't limited to Wall Street. It's taken away real livelihoods from real people because the entire world economy was ruptured, and as a result of which real economies have suffered deeply, and the three trillion dollars of bailout has just helped the banks make bigger profits. Ordinary people have lost their homes, have lost their jobs, are losing their lives. And I, I do believe the alienation of our consciousness, the alienation of our human experience from real well-being is at the root of it. That's why I'm so pleased that a tiny nation like Bhutan decided to give up GDP measures and went for gross national happiness. In fact, they've invited me later this year to come and attend a conference to take this issue further, that what we need to measure is well-being and happiness, and not just of human beings. I remember the 60th birthday of His Holiness, I had to give an opening speech for the celebrations. And of course, I talked what, about what concerns me deeply, the patenting of seed, also about ma making money, um, the genetically mo modified crops. And at the end of it, His Holiness just wrote a little note saying, every being has a right to happiness. All of us have an obligation and universal responsibility to protect that right. Uh, and, and I think that needs to be the basis of the economy, unless we have that ethics. Economy has destroyed ecology. Economy has destroyed culture. Economy has destroyed economic security because economy became a measure of money rather than a measure of planetary well-being and human well-being. Well, you know, there are two processes of globalization. One is the planetary process, a planetary process of recognizing that we are Earth citizens, as I've written in my book, Earth Democracy. But that is about recognizing how life is organized at the micro level, at the local level, at the regional level, at the planetary level, and seeing the seamless continuity between all these levels. 
But the other globalization, in fact, is against planetary globalization. It's about globalizing the worldview of a very narrow group of people. And that narrow group of people are the people who control the world of corporate business and giant corporations who have, through globalization, basically sought only one thing. How do you get bigger markets and how do you make more profits? That's all. Globalization, as enshrined in the rules of the World Trade Organization, is nothing more than how does Cargill control the wheat supply of every country. I am fighting a case in the Indian Supreme Court where we were importing wheat from Cargill, which was substandard, when we had enough wheat growing in India and uh, our health standards to import were being distorted because unfortunately in the United States, the U.S. administration thinks they owe alliance first and foremost, not to the citizens of the United States and not to the citizens of the world, but they have to create markets for Monsanto, they have to create markets for Cargill, they have to create markets for Conagra, markets for ADM, and that's what a perverse globalization is about. That's what pushed 200,000 farmers in India to suicide, because if our agriculture was not being driven by Monsanto for seed, and was not being driven by the distortions of the U.S. subsidies, our farmers wouldn't be dying. We'd be using our local seeds, growing wonderful organic cotton. And in fact, because of the suicides, I have initiated a program called Seeds of Hope three years ago, going into what we call the suicide belt, because I got fed up of counting the suicides. I said, it, you know, the, we have to build an alternative against all the aggression of Monsanto. We supply seeds to farmers, we help them go organic, and then we help them find just markets and fair markets, and they're earning 10 times more than the farmers growing GMO cottons, even though the GMO promise was you'll make more money. But that's, in fact, the irony of the money-driven economy, that while it makes people think, here's a way to make more money, people end up losing every step of the way. And the state of the United States today is so clear. Everyone was told, yeah, buy on credit. This is your way out. Consume your way to death. And that consumer machine has now driven to a halt. And because the consumer machine of this country, based on $14 trillion of private household debt, was also driving the Chinese machine, it was also driving the Indian machine, it starts to send ripples around the world. So I would call this perverse globalization because it's going against every ecological principle of sustainability. You can't have that level of consumption without predating on the planet. And it's also going against what is it that human beings really need? I mean, shopping has never been a way to satisfaction. Show me one shopping addict who says, now I've shopped enough. There's no notion of enough, just like in any other addiction. Enoughness is not an experience. So you have to get the experience of enoughness from somewhere else. Well, I find my hope from two places. One is I actually do the work of building alternatives, reducing the dependence of people on money, external inputs, increasing their own self-reliance based on working with nature because the partnership with nature is our alternative to money. If I can have seeds saved on my farm, then I don't need the money to grow the next crop. But if I'm dependent on Monsanto, I will need huge amounts of money, which I won't have, therefore I'll get into debt, I'll send my, sell my kidneys, I will take my life. Um, so this partnership with nature, to, to do the real creative, real productive work and shift your idea of what is productive. It's not productive to drown farmers in indebtedness. It's not productive to put 10 times more energy into a farming system to get one tenth the energy out as a food system. It's false and negative all the way. The second level at which I get um, huge amounts of hope is from the fact that actually ordinary people overwhelmed by this ideologies, false ideologies, false consciousness of a money machine, false globalization, all of this, they know they don't want this. 
they know this is not where they're getting their deep satisfaction and their deep security, but they feel hesitant to challenge because the machine is too big. And I get my hope from the fact that you just reach out a hand, you know, communicate a little bit, and these layers, you know, it's like veils being removed. And people say, yeah, exactly, that's how I feel. And then you realize the majority of humanity is seeking, very simply, living the good life on the basis of the right way on this planet. That's all they're seeking. They don't want anything more. And they're being prevented from doing that. So I get a lot of hope from the fact that you remove these veils, and at the people at the bottom of it are, are, are just spiritual human beings. And they, they know that and they understand that. Um, they are not first and foremost consumers. They're first and foremost members of community, members of social community, members of a human community, members of an earth community. And that's what's giving them joy. And then they get a twinkle in their eye. Well, all I can do is share what, uh, what I did in moments of the feeling of deep, oppression. In 87, I was invited to a meeting on biotechnology. The big industry laid out its dream world. How every seed would be genetically engineered. How every seed would be patented. And how there'd be a global constitution, which at that time was called the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, and in 95 became the World Trade Organization. And how through this they would implement this world. And I heard this and I said, but this is a dictatorship. It's a dictatorship over life. It's a dictatorship over our lives. If I cannot say no to GMOs, I'm not living in a free world. If every seed is patented, biodiversity is not free. And since I've given my life to protection of biodiversity and I've grown up both in a home and in a country where defending freedom has been our very oxygen, um, I thought of, you know, what do you do when this total dictatorship dream is being put into place? And I thought of Gandhi. You know, when the British ruled the world, they ruled 80% of the territories of this world. And they had said, the sun never sets on the British Empire because they controlled such a large part of the planet. And Gandhi did something simple. He pulled out a spinning wheel. He said, if you control us through the textile industry where you've taken slaves from Africa, to grow the cotton in America. You've enslaved our people to grow indigo. Uh, you've destroyed our, our textile industry. And in fact, they used to cut off the thumbs of the best weavers, so our weavers could not weave textiles that in spite of mechanization stayed superior in terms of quality and fineness. Um, Gandhi took out the spinning wheel and said, we'll spin our cloth. We will not be slaves. And I just thought of the seed at the spinning wheel and started to save seeds. Now, I do believe one thing is happening in the United States right now. People are turning to gardening. I know small seed businesses are getting created without people being aware of the politics, the larger politics of WTO, trade-related intellectual property rights, etc. They're just saving seeds. They want to do something that brings them power. And I think that is one very important step. But there is another key that Gandhi left us with for dealing with oppressive law, oppressive regime. A hundred years ago, he wrote a little book. And the interesting thing is, on September the 11th of another period, nearly a hundred years ago, he and the Indian community took the first Civil Disobedience Acts, and he gave it the name Satyagraha, which means the fight for truth. The South Af African apartheid, ap apartheid regime was insisting that everyone constantly wear an identity badge on the basis of race. I'm an Indian, I'm black, I'm, uh, I'm white. And Gandhi and the Indians said, but we are citizens together, equal. We will not be divided in this way. We will not wear these badges. He came back to India, and the British tried to make the salt law, said, we will make salt, because by making salt, they had a monopoly, they could buy more guns, shoot more Indians. Gandhi walked to the beach and said, nature gives it for free, we need it for our survival, and we will not obey your salt laws. That's how we have dealt with patent laws in genetic engineering. Three times I have stopped the government of India for, from passing laws by mobilizing farmers, millions of farmers, taking a simple pledge, 
We receive the seed from nature and our ancestors. We have to pass it on to future generations. We will save it. We will share it. We will not recognize patterns that make saving and sharing of seed a crime. And we will follow the consequences of whatever this means. And I believe that key understanding that Gandhi had, which then King, Martin Luther King had, and every freedom lover of our period has had, the recognition that as long as the superstition exists, that unjust law and unjust systems must be obeyed, so long will slavery exist. That's what Gandhi said in his book, Hind Swaraj, written a hundred years ago. I think that's what every citizen needs to experience every day of our lives, that there are higher laws. And the higher laws come from ecology, from the universe, from our place in it. Those are the laws of ethics. Those are the laws that tell us how to live the right way. And those laws will always be higher than the laws of making money for some people. I think the money system, especially the, the global capital system that has grown out of money, because, you know, like I said, money as mediator has existed in societies before. Money was taken to another level of privilege when the entire modern economy was created on the basis of GDP and uh, gross national product. It was taken to the next level with globalization, where mysterious money had higher power than ordinary citizens. And if you really look at the World Trade Organization rules, what do they say? That you as a citizen in, of India, or you as a citizen of the United States, don't have the same rights as a global corporation which has higher rights. So if you want to protect your livelihood, you cannot protect it. It's called protectionism, as if it's the ultimate sin. But a global corporation investing in any country with its capital, which is in, in, indirectly, eventually, of course, money, money has a higher right than people. So if a corporation wants to invest in the United States or wants to sell products in the United States, it has a higher right than US citizens. If Cargill wants to sell, cotton or wheat in India, or Monsanto wants to sell seeds in India, it has higher rights than the farmers of India. That higher right given to those who control money is at the basis of the huge tragedies that we see everywhere, whether it's the farmers' suicides in India or the loss of homes and loss of work after the economic collapse and the financial collapse of India. But it's not just the economic collapse. If you have the rule of money, and that's what globalization is, the rule of money, the rule of corporations, then the rule of people as democracy must die. Democracy must mutate necessarily, structurally, systemically into of the corporations, for the corporations, by the corporations who control the money. And it must stop being by the people, of the people, for the people. I just want to give you a simple example. The Indian constitution, is a very, very democratic constitution. After all, it was written at the time of our freedom. And it has been deepened in democracy with 1994 amendment, called the 73rd and 74th amendment, extended also to indigenous community areas. And it says that the village community is the highest authority to decide what happens to its land, its water, its forest. Not the parliament, not the executive, nobody else can intervene. And in the 94, 95 period, I used to be invited to tribal areas where dancing and singing all night communities would say, oh, this German firm wants to have a steel plant, but we don't want it. We don't want money. We don't want their jobs. We just want our forests and our lives. And they would turn it down. And once, twice, thrice, I saw it happen. And then came WTO in 95. By then, the corporations had the highest right. The corporations were able to move the Indian state to go shoot when communities were making their decisions democratically, according to the constitution, to not allow their land to be taken over, to not allow their forest to be taken over. And after a few years of violence by the corporate state, because the state now is no more an independent public state, it's not a welfare state, it becomes a corporate state. The corporate state then becomes a militarized state. They started to shoot and kill. Today, one third of India, which is the tribal zone of India, 
is what they call Maoists and Naxalite. But they're basically tribals rising now in violent form because their democratic expression was extinguished. So you will see the growth of this kind of violence in the world as democracy dies. And that's why I wrote my book, Earth Democracy. I said, we are trying to create living democracy because the older democracy has been destroyed in its limited capacity. Representative democracy anyway was for the better endowed people of society, but now even that limited representational ability has been killed. Representative dem democracy is now the rule of money, and the rule of money means the end of the rule of people, which is what democracy should be. I think Gandhi would say exactly what he already said a hundred years ago. The first thing he would say is that to be free, you have to be free of the domination of economic power and money. He identified money as a huge problem for democracy and freedom. And the second thing he would say is your moral duty to freedom is higher than your duty to obey the rule of money. He'd say that to us. But you know, the point is you can't say no to money if you are not first no, you cannot say no to money if you haven't found your real being. The courage to say no. The courage to say no to an oppressive system that pretends to be bringing you better opportunities, higher standard of life. After all, how has all this happened? It's happened with three simple words. Increased standard of living, better material consumption, and progress. These are the code words of why we should constantly sacrifice our state of well-being for some mysterious thing that money is creating for us. And you can only re realize that this is an illusion. You can recognize the illusion and say no if you've been able to go within yourself. And from that well, from that reservoir, which, what is it but a spiritual reservoir, tap the courage, because then it doesn't need courage, actually, because then it's a simple outcome of knowing, but I don't have to subject myself to this tyranny, because it is tyranny. Absolutely, it's a natural movement of love, which is why in Gandhi's thinking and in the thinking of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, compassion is the key word. Compassion is the key word, and again and again, it's clear that you have compassion as a natural outflow of a relationship. And that feeling, co-compassion, you know, knowing that the well-being of all is your well-being, it can only come out of a deep awareness that you're part of this amazing planet, amazing universe, amazing being. Because no deep spiritual tradition, no deep um, um, shift in our cultural identity has ever been only local, never. It's always been universal. All, you know, what the Dalai Lama talks about universal responsibility. He doesn't talk about only personal responsibility to your personal self and your little backyard. He talks about universal responsibility. And, um, and in, in the ancient Indian texts, I mean, the two that really inspire me in my work and have in fact been the matrix of my political economy. One is Gandhi's statement that the earth has enough for everyone's needs, but it doesn't have enough for a few people's greeds. greed. That, and where, what is greed but the lust for money? Um, the second is an ancient text called the Isha Upanishad, which says, if I take more than I need, then I'm stealing. I'm stealing either the share of other beings or I'm stealing the share of other human beings, or I'm stealing the share of future generations. I only have a right to that which sustains me. Beyond that, it is theft. And once you have that ecological awareness, then you have the ethical blueprint of the right way to live. And I think we, if, if this huge, deep crisis that was unleashed in September 2008 is the biggest opportunity humanity has to liberate ourselves from shallow consumerism and to liberate ourselves from the illusion of money. I think exactly what is written on these pieces of paper, 
the recognition that money is merely a promise that binds an exchange. But behind that is something else, something real. There's people, creative, productive people, engaged in relationships of compassion, solidarity, and well-being for each other. And as long as we have that totally in our minds, then money does not become our dominator and our ruler. It is just a mechanism of exchange.